Hello, my name is Robert Fish and I am Reader in Human Ecology in the School of Anthropology and Conservation here at the University of Kent. Last night, I asked my seven-year-old son, what's this? To which he replied, Daddy, that's where we live. If I were to ask you what this image signified to you, perhaps you might come up with a similar proposition. Or perhaps you might say the world or planet Earth, or climate, or nature, or environment. Perhaps for some of you, it signifies our inconsequential existence in the great scheme of things. To paraphrase the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, an utterly insignificant little green planet cartwheeling its way around a small, unregarded yellow sun. I pass this image every day as I walk along the corridor to lectures and meetings. It adorns the wall of our academic school. We even have a globe suspended from the ceiling in the entrance to our department. These symbols and artefacts are actually important to anthropologists and conservationists. In our school, we bring together researchers students who have a serious commitment to making sense of our relationship not only to each other but to nature as biological entities, as cultural agents, as citizens, as members of communities, as resource users and as consumers. Human ecology, my own field, sits right in the middle of that conversation. It's a field of study that interrogates these many roles and relationships and seeks to promote understanding of nature's life-giving, life-saving and life-affirming role in people's lives. It's very easy to obscure and forget this point. I'm reminded every time I read the newspapers and they say that the environment is variously 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 15th, 20th, number 100 on the list of public priorities, voter priorities, way down, as if our number one concerns for jobs, homes, health, crime, weren't also fundamentally connected and rooted in our dependence on the natural world. So in human ecology, we probe and reflect on this relationship between people and their environments, asking questions that are often quite profound, very serious, certainly complex, complex and contested. Are we part of or apart from nature? What ethical considerations should guide how we think and act towards the natural world? How does the natural environment act as a constraint or limit on human action? Can we find in the study of the natural world clues about how humans organise themselves? And perhaps most fundamentally, how should we imagine, plan and manage the environment as an asset for people? Now, we can only begin answering these questions, I would argue, by reflecting back on ourselves and our values, and more generally, on a vast body of knowledge and indeed images and representations that shape our assumptions. Here is Earthrise. According to Time magazine, it's one of the definitive images, if not the definitive image, that changed the world. Just reflect on that for a moment. An image taken outside of the world, actively shaping our world. We tend to think of representations as things that simply reflect our realities rather than create them. But the truth is otherwise. Human ecology is no different. Many within my field, myself included, look at these images and tend to think of the earth as a system a social ecological system. Now that's a rather perhaps inelegant way of emphasising the mutual 
dependencies of human and non-human processes, our co-evolution, our cohabitation, our common ground. Many of our approaches to managing this codependency are not fit for purpose. If our purpose is in part to secure our place in the future, <coughs> much of the way in which human environment relations function and develop, certainly in the Western society, are shaped by tired assumptions of an empty and spacious world, that the only limits to action are our ingenuity and of converting nature into a limitless resource by way of applications of human capital, not least through technological and scientific advancement. In an important sense, human ecology in the 21st century is about developing frameworks for action governed by the assumption of a full and congested world rather than an empty and spacious world. A world of scarce resources, of multiple demands, and of conflicting values. There are many different pathways towards dealing with this complexity. Much of the current thinking in the field of natural resource management centres on recognising more fully the many and diverse contributions that this thing called nature bestows upon us. We actually struggle to communicate this point. Students of Monty Python may well remember the scene from The Life of Brian when John Cleese asks, what have the Romans ever done for us? Sanitation. Yeah, apart from sanitation, what have the Romans ever done for us? Roads. Yeah, apart from the roads, what have the Romans ever done for us? Democracy. Oh, democracy. This is much the same conversation that resource management feel that they're in. What has nature ever done for us? Food, apart from the food. Fibre, apart from the fibre. Clean water, apart from clean water. Climate and water regulation and so forth. And they ask, why is this value realised so unevenly in the decisions we make? Why does some of this value seem invisible in the decisions we make? Why can't we integrate, understand these benefits or contributions more fully into our concerns and to coordinate ourselves better? Here is an image of a field in Lancashire, taken recently, after a flood. Or is it a lake? How would the human ecologist look at that image? Well, perhaps first, a great example of how one combination of values about nature, the need for shelter to meet demand, and the setting of land as a mechanism to realise that value, are actually ignoring empirical realities. And maybe that choice of location was built on another set of values, the cultural value of a glorious view, expressed as an attractive development opportunity. It makes no sense to build on this location because it is contradicted by yet another set of values in nature, that of nature as something perhaps rather uncontrollable, livelihood and life-threatening and only partially foreseeable. We might surmise that something was found wanting in the risk assessment here. Today, human ecologists would look at this problem and look for some solutions from the perspective of a system. We only have to travel a few hours north to North Yorkshire from this location to find communities investing in soft, what we might call nature-based solutions, planting more trees, building small natural dams, tinkering with land management to slow the flow of water. These investments can represent significant benefits on our traditional responses to problems, to build the wall a little higher, to hard engineer our way out of problems. At least part of the approach in human ecology is to find patterns and approaches that work within a larger ecological framework. 
There are many other examples of thinking emerging based on si a systems perspective, based on harmonising our many and varied uses of the natural world. If you're inclined to recreate in bathing waters, in many industrialising and agriculturally intensive nations, you might stand to ingest potential pathogenic presences arising from upstream land management practices. You may do so simply from drinking the water from the tap. So why not manage these problems at source? Why not compensate the land managers for changing their practices which are contributing to this problem rather than investing, say, in expensive water treatment technologies? It will also save, of course, business from all those days off work that people are having from gastroenteritis. And what of the view from your window? If you are lucky to have a view over Green's Place or access to a park, your luck is probably translating into a long-term cost saving to the National Health Service. So let's look at this. Let's look at this shadow economic value and invest in the natural health service. Let's make space for nature through a vision of ecological public health. These are some of the ways in which the human ecologists might approach human environment relationships in the 21st century. Unraveling these possibilities, we might say, is built on a degree of optimism in this systems worldview, there is potentially a lot of space for human ingenuity, for a commitment to rational management, trial and error, as well as looking at management for an economic starting point, including a role for the market. But it is also a worldview that is more than purely economic, that is more than purely scientific. It's one that encourages us to draw on more distributed forms of knowledge, the role of civil society. And it's about building institutions that represent the collective, shared and public good, the state. Above all, it is one that recognises with humility and a keen critical eye that solutions are never final and beyond revision. So as a human ecologist, I invite you all to join this creative and urgent conversation about people and the environment in the 21st century. Thank you very much.